You are listening to Book Clips, a mini podcast in which authors or narrators do readings from novels. Check out the show notes for the synopsis and buy links for this book. The Muse. Written by Susie Carr. Narrated by Susie Carr. Chapter 1. I stopped within an inch of indulging in my first kiss when I was 14 years old. Since escaping that mishap, I've been convinced of one thing. In my lifetime, I would never experience that basic coming-of-age milestone. I would bet my life that I, Jane Knoll, was the only 29-year-old person in my office who had yet to tingle at the touch of someone's lips against her own. According to all modern-day social norms, I was pathetic and lonely. However, I had way too much going on to be forced into believing for one second that I was lonely and pathetic. Just because I lost my BFFs back in the eighth grade when they drew their daggers against me didn't mean that I would never smile or laugh again. I've managed just fine without the need of a right-handed, left-handed, and backhanded lover or friend to guide me. Most people only dreamed of their destinies, whereas I controlled mine by taking action on it. Like just the other day, I wanted strawberry ice cream. So I bought some. I didn't have to justify to anyone why I ventured out to the convenience store five blocks away. No, I just climbed out of my pajama bottoms, put on a pair of jeans and a bra, and drove to meet up with my destiny for the evening. Spoonful after spoonful of strawberry heaven. I've always been grateful for those wide expanses of freedom that defined my life. I was hardly pathetic or lonely. At least I wasn't the type of girl who would be so pathetic as to neglect watering her plants on Saturdays, or especially not the type who didn't understand the principles of proper feng shui and the alignment of good space. I made time for those things without having to regard how it would impact anyone else's time and space. When I wanted to place a giant water fountain near my front door, I did so with reckless abandon, pulling no stops on its lavish display. Surely, if my mother had pulled such a stunt, my father would have crucified her hard work and time by forcing her to take it down, repackage it, and send it back. I was free, and for that, I was grateful. I was also grateful for my job as a marketing headline copywriter and proofreader at one of the country's leading sporting goods manufacturers. I just loved my cushy cubicle with its tall, beige, checkered walls, and view of the beautiful spider plant in my neighbor Doreen's cubicle. She resembled my grandma, with her floral dresses, wide hips, and shimmering silver hair that was most certainly set on rollers every Saturday at the corner beauty shop. She always spoiled me. No one else got to sink her teeth into corn muffins every Wednesday and blueberry bagels with cream cheese every Friday, like I did. She respected my space and only interrupted me when she dropped off those delicious treats or wanted to share some big news that might shake our days. A few weeks ago, as she passed me my corn muffin, she told me that a new branch had opened up in New York City and some of the new staff members were coming to our Mid-Atlantic office for introductions. On the last introduction day, my team leader tasked me to brew the coffee and ensure the creamer jugs were filled. She honored Doreen with the task of creating labels for each attendee. We were a couple of important people at the office. How would the enterprise ever remain intact without us if one day we woke up and decided we'd rather dig holes in a garden and plant tomatoes? I wondered that all the time, when I wasn't fretting over my hair, my makeup, my clothing, or for that matter, when I wasn't worrying about how we'd ever managed to keep the earth rotating in its planetary alignment, or how we'd ensure that the clouds rained down enough water to keep us drought-free for the remainder of the planet's lifespan. Yeah, you guessed it. I happen to be a tad bit sarcastic. And justifiably so. Years of bullying did that to a person. Hey, at least the cynicism kept me company. If it weren't for its constant presence, I probably would have drunk poison or leaped off the side of the pretentious office building's roof by now. I enjoyed my daily work. Cynicism didn't stand alone as my friend. No. Piles of excitement blanketed my daily grind. I was so thrilled that I spent $30,000 on a master's degree in English and that I enjoyed the full advantage of that big splurge 
by spending my days swimming in a sea of marketing jargon that touted the world's best-fitted golf shirts and swimming trunks. I was that lucky English major who got to spend her day in a private cubicle, searching for misspelled words and parenthetical phrases placed in the wrong parts of sentences. Oh, yes, you probably guessed it again. I was the lucky one who lived out her dreams correcting others' mistakes. My lips are tugging upwards into a smile with that confession. I was the epitome of happiness, sitting in my cubicle, snacking on corn muffins made too stale for human consumption, and drinking coffee that tasted more like dirty water than delicious java beans. I would like to tell you truthfully what I'd really love to do one day. I'd love to stand up on my desk and tell all the glory stealers to kiss my ass. Speaking of wanting to tell someone to kiss my ass, Katie, a graphic designer in marketing, just left my boss, Sanjeev, in his office. If anyone deserved to be stuck in a cubicle, making less money in a year than what I owed back in student loans, sitting in a chair less ergonomic than a concrete slab, it would be her. Thank goodness she did. She slapped on a sugary smile each day and fed me small helpings of her sarcasm. She hated me for things outside of my control. I couldn't help it if her husband was a dirtbag pervert and that Sanjeev would rather suffer a fall down a flight of stairs and deal with her. In a messed up way, I enjoyed sharing sarcastic smiles with her. We volleyed our fake niceties back and forth like a couple of well-trained experts. She played hard. I did, too. My years of bully hell taught me well. That morning, she walked right past me without regard, strutting by in her high heels and goody-two-shoes attitude. Sanjeev walked out of his office and headed straight toward me. He straightened his blue corporate tie, smiled into a few cubicles as he passed them, and stopped right outside of mine. The rest went down as such. Hey, Jane, he said with a pleasant smile. I hope you don't mind but could I ask for your help with proofing some pieces before our new colleagues get here? I want them perfect. He handed me a black folder with the company's Gold Boss logo on it. Katie mentioned your in-between projects. Oh, did she? I pointed my eyes down at the pile of work she had placed on my desk that morning with a big note, due by noon. I don't mean to bother you, he said. Is it too much? He always spoke with a reserved respect. I adored his Indian accent. He added a W into places where it didn't even belong. That little speech oddity powered me with a confidence around him and created a safe haven for those times when he stared at me just a little too long. Of course not, Sanjeev. I smiled at him and he flushed. I'll take care of it for you. He whispered a thank you, tapped the doorframe to my cubicle, and strolled away with his hands knotted at his lower back. Doreen popped over to my cubicle a few seconds later. Her hair was cropped tighter than usual, and her lips were a shade too pink for the fluorescent lights. He's got such a crush on you. It's ridiculous. You're insane, I said. I spun my chair away from her and waved her off like I did every time she said that to me. He only flushed around me because of the time I forgot to button my shirt completely, and to both of our horrors, I caught him staring into the deep cleavage that my ill-fitted bra created. He's not going to be single forever. I swiveled around to face her. Doreen, I've got zero interest in hooking up with Sanjeev. I also had zero interest in men. But, like everything else about me, I kept that safe. Oh, if only I were 30 years younger, I'd be all over that. I'd love to step inside her worldview for just a day to experience life without the overcast shadows of doubt left behind from years of listening to mean girls tell me how much they didn't like me and watch as they destroyed my life and the lives of those I cared for the most. A week later, the new staff from the New York City office arrived. I dashed off to the bathroom before having to succumb to long speeches and endless applause. I was washing my hands when in walked a tall, dark-haired woman wearing a smart-fitted dress and a smile. She reminded me of someone who would have grown up in middle-to-upper-class America, living in a mini-mansion in a bedroom swaddled in everything pretty and pink. I imagined she was always followed by a trail of pretty girls who spent their time laughing at girls like me, girls who shied away from anyone who could have damaged their already damaged lives. 
She passed by and stopped right before entering a stall. I feel really silly asking this, she said in a low, raspy voice. But can you tell there's something kind of strange about my outfit? She rested her hand on her curvy hip, posing like a runway model. I stopped lathering soap in my hands, biting down hard on the derisive words that, had I been a braver woman, would have knocked her down a few notches from her pretty little perch. I knew her type too well, entitled to stares and dropped jaws. Rather than attempt it, I scanned her taupe dress, her bare calves, and her sandaled feet, like a fearful bird pecking crumbs in the wake of hasty Taurus. I turned back to the sink, into the safety of the running water, and shrugged. Looks fine, I mumbled. So, you didn't notice my mistake? I looked back up at her reflection in the mirror, skirting around her penetrating eyes, her dark, wavy hair resting at her breasts, and her exotic features. I shook my head. In my peripheral, I saw her nod with gracious appeal. She turned and entered the stall. Okay, then. All is good. I continued washing my hands while checking out her slender ankles and the way her sandals cradled her feet so delicately. Her crimson toenails sparkled, and the strings of her sandals flirted with her soft, smooth, creamy skin. I grazed from one pretty sandal to the other. That's when I noticed her mishap. She wore one dark blue sandal and one black one. An imperfect beauty. My heart twirled as I shut off the water. I tore off the paper towel and hid my giggle until I passed well out of earshot of the woman wearing two different colored shoes. The joy of such a discovery saddled me in giddiness. Eva Handel was her name. I guessed her to be part Chinese and part white. When she entered the meeting room minutes later, my breath hitched. She moved through the air as gentle as wind swept through a field of wildflowers, delicate, yielding, and breezy. When she took to the podium, she sprinkled us in smiles and good wishes for a successful second quarter. Her eyes sparkled under the golden overheads, and they waltzed from one person to the next, connecting us in her sweet lullaby. Her golden cheeks glistened, her dark hair cascaded like pretty ivy around her shoulders, and her inflection pitched in just the right places. Her sandals stood out to me like a well-wrapped gift offering me a most impeccable view of a most flawless mishap. She spoke with eloquence and grace, undeterred by her mismatched sandals and the 300-plus people who sat staring at her. She joked about her bumpy motorcycle ride down the New Jersey Turnpike from the city and about how excited she was that her bike came complete with a small hatch so she could pack her running shoes and her sandals. Even from the back row of the room, I caught the gleam of humor in her eye as she balanced her secret like a well-trained model balanced a book on her head. She danced around her secret, playing with it, and placing it out in front for all to see. A magician with an invisible wand, a hot biker chick with a knack for humor. Eva Handel could carry a crowd with ease. Where luck failed, she used wit to pull her through. She said how excited she was to be part of our team and eager to learn from each of us how she could take live events to a whole new level. She discussed future plans to initiate a series of public service announcements geared at piquing the interest of the youth into setting exercise into their daily habits. She opened her arms wider and talked with her hands as she climbed the rudders of joy. She loved camera work and couldn't wait to get started on those short clips. When she finished her speech... She sat back down on the stage next to a bald guy wearing a bright orange shirt and blue tie. She smiled and joked around with that guy, who gazed into her eyes and swayed into her. The two chummed it up in private musings, leaving the rest of us to guess what playful secrets they were sharing. For the remainder of the speeches, I couldn't help but stare at her from the safety of my back row seat. I enjoyed the soft way her lips curled up into a smile whenever someone referenced her and the subtle sexiness of her ankles as she crossed them over each other time and again. A movement so unobvious to onlookers, yet so intense to me. At one point, I looked up from her mismatched sandals and into her eyes. She caught me and offered me a knowing smile. I flushed and sank lower in my seat, surprised by the flutters and my racing heart. I circled my gaze around the room, 
with my head in a halo of joy, wondering if anyone else noticed that the most beautiful girl in the room just smiled at me. Yes, she smiled at me. You have been listening to Book Clips. Check out the show notes for the synopsis and buy links for this book. If you are interested in showcasing your novel, then check out the show notes for more information.